Okay, let's open our Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, today. Hebrews, chapter 3. And let's read verses 1 through 6 as we begin another chapter. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who is faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. We'll stop right there. Now we've come to a comparison of Moses and Christ. Previously, in chapters 1 and 2, we discussed Christ's superiority over the angels. But now, we're introduced to his superiority, superiority even over the great lawgiver, Moses. At the time of the Lord Jesus' coming, Moses was revered as an idol, as a hero among Israel. Uh, we read, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou there in John 8, verses 4 and 5? Christ healed a blind man in John chapter 9, who had been blind from his birth. And the Pharisees said to the blind man, Thou art his disciple, Christ's, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses, but as for this fellow, meaning Christ, we know not from whence he is, there in John 9, verses 28 and 29. And uh, if you will, go back to the book of Acts, chapter 15, for just a second. Acts 15. And one verse there, notice there, verse 21. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So as I say, Moses was regarded as the great uh, hero of the nation of Israel and the, the history of the Jews. Here in verse 1, we read, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, there's the true prince of apostles, Jesus Christ, uh, which the Catholic Church keeps talking about, but they have the wrong apostle. And high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. The, the apostle is Jesus Christ. When Roman Catholics call Simon Peter the prince of the apostles, they're giving him a title that properly belongs to Jesus Christ. Um, go, back, go back, if you will, to the book of John, Chapter 17, John chapter 17, and notice here the Lord Jesus is praying in most of this chapter, uh, the night he was going to be betrayed, he was with his disciples and he's praying for all of them, and uh, notice chapter 17 verse 11, he says to God the Father, and now I am no more in the world. But these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. That's the only time in the Bible the phrase Holy Father appears. And it's a reference by Jesus Christ to the Heavenly Father. And yet that is the title stolen by the Roman Catholic popes and applied to their popes. They call him Holy Father, the Holy Father. Doesn't matter how rotten he might have been as a priest, doesn't matter how many crimes he may have committed, doesn't matter how much of the church money he's embezzled, doesn't matter how many children he's molested. They call him Holy Father. What a great example. What a great example. But um, 
Here's a book. Here's a book uh, written by a Catholic named Greg Tobin uh, on selecting the Pope. This was after the, or near the time of Pope John Paul II's death, and who would they select after him? But the Pope has uh, numerous titles. Um, so I'll just read you a, a little bit of it. The papacy, also called the Petrine Ministry, means the ministry of Peter, or office held by the Pope, is a concept that has developed from the tradition surrounding the Apostle Peter's life, his ministry, and martyrdom in Rome into its contemporary form through 20 tumultuous centuries. He's called the Bishop of Rome. He's called the Vicar of Jesus Christ. I mentioned that, I think, last week in our sermon time. The, the phrase vicar means a substitute or a representative of Jesus Christ. And they believe since Jesus isn't on the earth now, he's left the Pope in charge of men's spiritual concerns. He's called the successor of the chief of the apostles. He's also called the supreme pontiff of the universal church. Pontifex Maximus, the supreme pontiff, was the title uh, given to the Caesars in the Roman Empire. And as the Roman Empire began to decline about the 300s, 400s AD, uh, the church, the Roman Catholic Church, which had latched itself onto the Roman Empire and created the state church, this official religion of the government, it came to rise and the Pope simply took the title that was once given to, the, uh, to Caesar, the great emperor, and they applied it to the Popes. He's called the Patriarch of the West. He's called the Primate of Italy. He's called the Archbishop and Metropolitan of the Roman Province. He's called the Sovereign of the Vatican City State. And he's called Servant of the Servants of God. Very humble, very uh, self-effacing, very uh, modest approach to yourself. The Pope uh, also wrote the book, uh, Humility and How I Attained It, as uh, conferred upon him by the College of Cardinals, perhaps. But back to our text. The high priest of our profession is also not a Pope or a Cardinal or a Bishop or any parish priest, right? Father Shenanigan. <laughs> He has two titles given to us in this verse. He's called the Apostle, and he's called the High Priest. You should remember those two titles in the future. And verse 2, who was faithful to him that appointed him, that is, God, the Father, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Now the house referred to here is the house of Israel as a, a household, those under his authority. Um, Hebrews 11 verse 7 talks about Noah preparing an ark to the saving of his house and in Acts 16 31 Paul and Silas told the Philippian jailer believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house meaning your entire family those under your charge uh, now Moses uh, was not faithful in his household all the time that should be kept in mind. It's made plain enough in a couple of places. I'll have you go back to the Old Testament, first of all, to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. And here Moses returning to Egypt. Now he has a wife and a couple of sons. Um, Exodus 4, verse 24. And it came to pass by the way in the inn that the Lord met him, Moses, and sought to kill him. <clears throat> then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. That's God let Moses go. Then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. As he had failed to circumcise his son before going back into Egypt, as every Jew was commanded to be circumcised. 
And then also run, if you will, to Numbers chapter 20. <clears throat> Numbers 20. And let's begin there at verse 10. Or verse 9. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, Therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Mirabah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. It was because of this act of unbelief, God had told Moses to speak to the rock. He had struck the rock once before, as God had told him, and water came out. This time he told them to merely, to simply speak to the rock. But Moses decided it was necessary to do what he had done before, and he smote the rock twice with his rod. God was gracious to the people, gave them water, but uh, that act of unbelief, that act of disobedience, was enough to keep him from entering into the promise. He wanted that he led these people for years already, and uh, brought them out of Egypt, a great multitude, one and a half million uh, to be conservative, following him, on foot, uh, out in the middle of the wilderness. And uh, after all of that, God sending the miracles and the plagues on Egypt to harden Pharaoh's heart and, and, and cause the Egyptians to actually want the, Israel, the Jews to, to leave. And after all of that, this act of rebellion, this act of disobedience was enough to keep Moses from being able to enter into the Promised Land when they finally arrived. But, um, this, the, the statement in our text about being faithful has to do with Moses' faithfulness in doing what God had told, them, told him to do in uh, constructing the tabernacle and all of its components and in giving the laws to the people. I want you to consider how many times we read, as you read through the Bible, you're reading the story of Moses and the Israelites and the Exodus going into the wilderness and wandering in the wilderness under Moses' leadership. How many times do you read the statement uh, such as these? Uh, all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did they, Exodus 39. And uh, Moses did as the Lord commanded him, Leviticus 8, verse 4. As the Lord commanded Moses, Exodus 40, verse 19. So the things that Moses was faithful in were those things that God had commanded him to do as the uh, leader of the Jews, giving them the law, constructing and building the tabernacle, the uh, garments for the priests, all the components, elements that would go into the tabernacle as God had instructed them. And um, the one uh, notable exception in the case of Moses' disobedience in the, in the matter of striking the uh, rock, there in Numbers 20, uh, and it was this act that caused him to lose his entrance into Canaan. That's because uh, that rock was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God is trying to establish a picture. Uh, we read in the New Testament that uh, that rock was a picture, a type of Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, and the reason, but, but that's not mentioned in the New Testament, it says he was faithful in all his house. And the reason uh, it's not mentioned in the, over in the New Testament, his sin seemed to have been overlooked uh, by the writer of Hebrews 3, verse 2. It's exactly the same reason that the Holy Spirit overlooks David's adultery when it lists him among the heroes of faith, Hebrews 11, verse 32. It overlooks Sarah's unbelief when God promised that she would bear a son in her old age, as her story in Aaron, Abraham's belief and faith in God is outlined for us in Romans 4. 
uh, it overlooks Jonah's backsliding when the Lord Jesus describes him uh, as a type of his burial in the tomb. As Jonas was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And it's the same reason that Rahab's lying. Remember when the two spies came to her house, she hit them and uh, allowed them to escape and simply lied to the authorities about where they were. They left, I don't know where they are. It's the same reason uh, Abraham's lying. James chapter 2 is not uh, mentioned. Remember, he said, uh, say that thou art my sister, not my wife, and that'll be well with me. My flesh shall live, or my soul shall live. And uh, it overlooks the, the um, sin of Moses for the same reason that Samson's immorality with the Philistines was overlooked. He took a wife of the Philistines. The Bible says it was, in effect, it was a ruse to win their support through his wife, and so he could secretly plan to murder a multitude of them, which he did. And then in the book of Judges, it says, Samson's wife was given to one of his companions, one of his friends. Well, that's pretty immoral. Marry a woman, you know, undoubtedly go in under her, as the Bible describes uh, sexual action. And then once you've used her to weaken her nation and get them to be trusting of you, go out and murder a thousand of them. Then give your wife over to another man. And um, it overlooks Jacob's deception of his father. Remember, he went in disguised like his brother Esau? But it's not mentioned in Romans 9, 13. The Bible says, Therefore Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. His deception, his sin, uh, his dishonesty, his uh, subterfuge was not mentioned uh, in, his, in the New Testament. It's like the New Testament has a way of overlooking the sins of the Old Testament saints. Almost as though the writers of the New Testament were in collusion with each other. Or it could be they understood something that unsaved churches, unsaved preachers today don't understand. That is the forgiving and the cleansing grace Amen. of God. Aren't you glad that God doesn't keep reminding you of every sin you ever committed, say, before you got saved? Amen. Or even every sin you've committed since you've been saved. Amen. You and I tend to remind ourselves of those things very often. And we wonder, how could God keep putting up with me the way that he does, the way that he has done, why would God save me when I've been so useless and worthless to him? How many times have I failed to live up to what I profess as a Christian, to not be the kind of believer that I ought to be in the eyes of other people, the eyes of people on the job, the eyes of people, uh, you, you, you name it, wherever you go. And yet God still is gracious and kind and forgiving when I go to him, confessing my sin, confessing my weakness, admitting my faults, admitting my failings to him, and asking him if he'd be so kind, give me another chance to start over, to be a testimony, to witness to my boss, or to witness to somebody, and bada boom, bada bing, uh, along comes a chance, Praise along comes some opportunity. And yeah, thank God for that. He doesn't hold the sins that we've put over our heads and say, I can't use you anymore because of this. Who knows what sins Brother Spurgeon committed when he was in the biker gang? He's still... God's using him to win souls. He's leading souls to the Lord. He's setting a good example. He's showing other men that they don't have to live a life of sin. They can turn to God. God can make something good out of their life. And um, think of every... Every person who's ever gone down the road of wickedness and debauchery, whether it's uh, some of our church members, I don't know what everyone's done. I don't need to know what everybody's done. It's none of my business. It's between them and God and them and the forgiving grace of God. But thank God that he doesn't keep reminding us of it. 
I'm so grateful for that. Then verse 3 in our text says, For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For this man, that's Jesus Christ, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as, now there's a general principle you can state here, he who hath built the house, Christ, hath more honor than the house. This principle should be applied um, in order to clarify the false doctrine, the nonsense preached by so many uh, so-called Christian groups today. They're not truly Christian groups, but they say that they are. The Mormon Church, they say that they're the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Because they have the words Jesus Christ in big letters on the side of their building. That proves they must be Jesus Christ's Church, right? Because they have big letters. It's like the Church of Christ. They must be Christ's Church. The sign says so. That proves it. <laughs> or the Roman Catholic Church. They say the Church that Christ founded. And the Roman Catholic Church has got to be, and my father said this many years ago, he's preaching a series on cults, and he said the Roman Catholic Church qualifies as the greatest cult in all of the world. And I believe that. Everything in the Catholic Church is phony and artificial. The beginning of the Catholic Mass, the priest goes to the back, behind the, the, behind the last pew, and he processes in up the center aisle with a couple of altar boys, carrying a, a crucifix or maybe some incense, and they all process up to the front while the congregation watches this parade go by, and then they bow towards the altar or towards the crucifix or the uh, an older Catholic church used to have that tabernacle, that brass container where they keep the wafers that have been blessed and turned into Jesus' body. They bow towards that, and then they go about and take their positions and go into their service. But the priest walks up the aisle in, the, in his uh, priestly robes, and all of these robes have different names, different terms for them, and they're also uh, the different elements are supposed to represent something different about his authority. And Rush Limbaugh always talks about the liberalism being a matter of symbolism over substance. And that's what Roman Catholicism is. Catholicism is. Uh, he has a costume. That's his theatrical costume. He has a, a script that he's reading out of a book. Uh, he has altar boys in their little costumes. He has, they have stained glass windows. They have music playing. They have incense. Those are all special effects. And uh, they run through the same script every week. It's the same thing uh, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And they make, and they, they are they're very dramatic. They hold their hands up during certain times of prayer. And then they make the sign of the cross. They'll kneel down in front of the altar to show their respect. They'll, sometimes you'll see them kiss the altar to show how respectful they are. Uh, and all of it's a bunch of theatrics. It means nothing. There's no substance to it at all. And in Roman Catholicism, they believe that the priest takes the wafer and the wine, and he pronounces these words of consecration over it, and that wafer and that wine immediately turn into the literal flesh and the literal blood, which was in Christ's human body. It just conveniently tastes like bread and tastes like wine. I often wonder, you know, and, and when they don't have enough people to come and take the wafers, they take those excess wafers that have been blessed um, and put those in the tabernacle for safekeeping until the next time they'll bring them out and add those and distribute those to the next Mass. I've often found it interesting that somehow the wine always gets finished by the priest. <laughs> the wafers might not get consumed, but the wine seems to always get finished. And um, it's all theatrics. It's a theatrical show. And um, you, you can say Christ founded our church, but do you know the founder? You read a book, but do you know the author? You see a building, do you know the builder? Do you know the true founder of the Church of Jesus Christ? That is the Lord Jesus Christ. People get the mistaken idea that, that Christ created a church. It's, an, it's a, a, an earthly organization, has earthly or organizational structure. There may be a uh, primary headquarters in some city in the world. 
and it's spread out across the world through their efforts, and certain missionaries have spread the, the message of their religion around, and somehow that membership in that particular church or in that particular organization is what constitutes salvation, that makes you qualified to be saved. And yet at the same time, not a single one of them offer eternal security to a member. Well, we, we trust and pray that if we're faithful to the commandments, the dictates, and trust the, the Latter-day Prophet, or trust the dictates of the Catholic Church and the popes and priests and cardinals, and trust the Church's teachings, that when we die, all of our good deeds will outweigh our bad deeds, and God will let us into heaven. That is not how salvation is decided. You decide right now whether you're going to trust Jesus Christ. If you don't, look forward to hell. If you do, you're on your way to... You're already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2, 6 tells us. But they offer no eternal security. They offer eternal insecurity. But... Um, and so many Christian groups that think that, and Jehovah's Witnesses the same way. They call themselves God's special organization. And you have to be a member of that organization and abide by the directives and the, the rules of their uh, worldwide headquarters in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, if you ever hope to be sick, it's a strange business. Whether it's a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, or a Roman Catholic, or a Lutheran, or a Presbyterian, or an Anglican Church of England, or Episcopal, Episcopalian, or many uh, United Methodists, and some feeble, uh, pitiful churches that have the word Baptist on their name, uh, or any other groups. They all preach that water baptism is a part of the new birth and a part of your salvation. And they all say water baptism is necessary, but of course only as it's done by us, not the way it's done by that other group or the other group over here. The only the way we do it is the right way. And the other churches know ours is the right way. And this one over here is no ours is the right way. And the truth is all of them are the wrong way. Water baptism never saved a dead dog or a fly. It can't save anybody. We had three new Christians get baptized this morning Water baptism did nothing for their salvation. It's an outward uh, testimony of an inward regeneration that's already taking place. But water baptism is a, an act by which we declare as a new Christian, I am now a believer in Jesus Christ. But that, that action has no spiritual benefit to you. It might be a blessing. You might, believe, you might be relieved that I've, I've obeyed the gospel, I've obeyed the scriptures, and doing what a new Christian ought to do, and your friends rejoice with you, and that's a true, that's truly a blessing. I remember when my father baptized me as a boy, it was such a, a sense of, I've done what I'm supposed to do as a new Christian, and it felt so good. I, I want to get, I'm do it 10 more times. I was just overjoyed, but, um, do you know the author of the book? Do you know the founder of the church? Not are you a member of it, but do you know the founder? And then verse 4 in our text. Uh, For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Now whether the house is made of bricks and mortar and plaster, or it's built up uh, through savings and checking accounts, it's still only one house. And um, it, it's not the universe and all the organic and inorganic matter contained in the universe. Um, God made the earth, and every carpenter, every builder, every construction company, every um, building industry has to go to the earth to extract the minerals, to extract the iron ore, to cut down the wood and produce the lumber in order to build a house. So God made everything um, from which man derives his creations in order to construct their houses. And the reference in this verse is plainly to the deity of Jesus Christ. Go back, if you will, to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Colossians 1, 
And let's begin there with verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him are all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he, Christ, might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. We'll stop there. Um, this verse alludes to the deity of Jesus Christ because in verse 6 we're going to read, But Christ as a son over his own house. This is not the case of a mere servant in the house. It's a son serving his father within his own house, the son's house. All things were created by him and for him. And uh, just as a little aside, I was when I'm intending to say this, but if this earth and the city of Jerusalem, to be specific, is going to be the, the home of Christ's earthly kingdom when he returns and he's going to be seated upon a throne in a rebuilt temple uh, judging the world and the rest of the universe by extension. That means that this earth is the center of God's attention. The earth is not simply one of nine planets revolving around the sun like all the rest of them do. That means the earth is the center of God's attention and everything else revolves around us. This is called geocentrism. The idea that, that the earth isn't rotating on its axis, it's not hurtling through space at 66,000 miles an hour around the sun, it's not going anywhere. Everything else is going around us. Go to the north. Now, I'll tell you what, um, I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't planning to dwell on this. And I'm, I'm still studying the, very, the whole idea. But you'll find nothing in the Bible suggesting that the earth goes around the sun. But Psalm 19 describes the sun as a, as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber to run his course. And the sun rising, the sun setting. And we say, well, what's simply language that adapts the... Uh, science to uh, what we see around us. It was it's not to be taken literally, but, but if we say we believe the Bible literally, we should take it literally. Say it's the sun that rises in the east and then it sets in the west. It's the sun going around us, not the other way around. Say, so, well, I have a hard time believing that. You know how many millions of miles the sun would have to travel every day to go around us? Yeah, I know that. But it's not any more ridiculous than to believe that the earth is hurtling through space at 66.6 uh, thousand miles an hour around the sun, and you can look at a, a, a lake and see it just as calm as can be. There's no friction, there's no vibration. We don't get the effect that we're hurtling through space at that speed. And not only that, but the astronomers will tell us, not only are we hurtling through space at 66,000 miles per hour, but the earth is rotating at 1,000 miles an hour, and the moon is orbiting around the earth, keeping pace with us, and both of us hurtling through space at the same time. And funny thing is, though, night after night after night, you could go out and fix your camera or your telescope on the North Star without any difficulty. If the earth is hurtling through space at that speed, with that much movement going on, not only that, but the astronomers tell us that the sun is also traveling through space, and we're sort of keeping up with it. There would be no way in the world that night after night after night you could fix your telescope or your camera on the North Star, take a whole time-lapse video of all the stars orbiting around the North Star. You would be, you'd be in a different position about every five minutes, right? You couldn't take a picture like that. 
Then you can get on the internet and research some of those time lapse videos. And um, I will say this much: if you if a camera is fixed on the North Star, which is the tail end star and the the, the handle of the Big Dipper, that's the North Star. If the camera is fixed on that, and you have a time lapse uh, setting, every 20 seconds or so, once it's dark, it takes another picture. You'll see. I'll from your, I'll do this from your angle. You'll see the stars orbiting uh, counterclockwise around the North Star. But if you take a picture of the sky on the southern hemisphere, down in Australia, you'll see the stars orbiting the other direction. That means one of two things. Either the Earth is rotating, as they tell us, or everything else is revolving around us, and you would get the same effect, the two directions of the stars uh, on the north and south poles. Now that disproves the whole idea that the Earth is flat. Because if the Earth was flat, everybody would see the stars moving in the same direction no matter where they were on the Earth. It's an idiotic idea that the Earth is flat. Your head is flat, but the Earth isn't. <laughs> Verse 5, it says, the things, well, let's read verse 5. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. The things which were to be spoken after were spoken by Christ. Run back, if you will, to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, we'll move along here. We're almost finished for today. John 6, notice there verse 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. He's making himself greater in stature than Moses. And Mo, uh, John chapter 7, verses 19 through 22. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil, who goeth about to kill thee? Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave, you, gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers, and ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Lord Jesus heals a lame man, and they complain because he did it on the Sabbath day. And the Lord Jesus points out the hypocrisy of them. Um, Moses said to, uh, God commanded them to rest on the Sabbath day. And also they were to circumcise their male babies on the eighth day following birth. But if the eighth day happened to fall upon a Sabbath day, what do they do? Do they wait and circumcise the next day in order to keep the Sabbath? Or do they keep and rest on the Sabbath day and violate the law of, or do they violate the, the law of the Sabbath and circumcise the child on the eighth day? They were in a real uh, uh, pickle, real conundrum. What do we do? He pointed out the weakness of Moses' law to them. Somehow they hadn't, it hadn't occurred to them that this is simply... Uh, a self-contradicting proposition. And um, he was said to be a prophet like unto Moses. In fact, Moses predicted the coming of the Lord Jesus. Deuteronomy 18, verse 18, The Lord thy God shall raise up a prophet among your brethren like unto me. And then in John chapter 1, verse 21, they came to John the Baptist and they asked, Art thou that prophet? They were waiting for a new, another prophet like Moses to show up. And, of course, John said no. Uh, only Jesus was that prophet. The only place where Moses really blew it, of course, was by striking the rock twice when he should have spoken to it. And uh, the rock was a type of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 4, tells who only died once, which uh, makes the professed actions of the Catholic priest in the Mass nothing but a blasphemy every time he does it. I... 
was going to read it from a book, which apparently I don't have in my library. It must be at home, on my bookshelf at home, uh, called The Faith of Millions by a priest named O'Brien back in the uh, early 1960s. And he says, when the priest pronounces the tremendous words of consecration, he reaches up into the heavens, brings Christ down from his throne, and renders him and places him again on our altars to be offered up again as the victim for the sins of mankind. He does this not once, but a thousand times. He says, um, that which uh, uh, is spoken of uh, angels and cherubim and seraphim, the priest's powers are greater than that of the angels. While the, the uh, Christ offered himself as a sacrifice once, the priest offers Christ as the eternal victim for the sins of mankind, not once, but a thousand times. The priest speaks and lo, Christ, the eternal and omnipotent God, bows his head in humble obedience to the priest's command. And then he says, the pre for the priest is and should be another Christ. Alter Christus is the Latin term. Look forward at Hebrews 10. I read that passage so many times, I've just about memorized all of it verbatim. Hebrews 10, and notice three great verses here. Verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How many times? Once, once for, all. for all. Verse 12. But this man, Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So Christ didn't need to be offered again and again and again repeatedly as a sacrifice on anyone's altar. Do you know that in the Roman Catholic altar, and they don't tell their people this, it's amazing how uh, incredibly ignorant most Roman Catholics are of their own religion. But that's okay. Uh, most professing Christians are ignorant of the scriptures. We're, we're an exception because we believe the Bible from cover to cover. I even believe the cover says Holy Bible. And... Uh, I, I was Ken Hovind's. I even believe the cover it says Ken Hovind on it, right? That's my Bible. But um, we believe the Bible from cover to cover. We believe every word there is the word by, by the direction of God. That's the word he wants me to see. That's the word he wants me to read. That's the word he wants me to memorize and to hear. And that's not my business to change anything in it. It's the Bible's job to change me. And by comparing Scripture with Scripture, we want the Scriptures to interpret themselves. Not so with so many other professing Christians. They might have been saved somewhere along the way. They might have trusted Christ to forgive them and their name is written in heaven. But uh, they've spent very little time reading the Word of God or wanting to learn the Word of God or understand how powerful the Word of God can be to direct their, their understanding of the rest of the world. But um, those three verses there are very powerful. Uh, to tell us that Christ didn't need to be sacrificed again and again and again. Look, look, look at Hebrews 10, and I'm going to finish right here. Hebrews 10, verse uh, 12. Notice how it reads. But this man, comma, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, comma, sat down on the right hand of God. In the old Douay rings, Catholic Bible, 1582. This is how their Bible reads. But this man, comma, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, comma, forever sat down on the right hand of God. <laughs> By moving that comma over eight spaces, they've opened the door for other sacrifices to be made following Christ. He simply offered one sacrifice. It wasn't one for all time, but it's simply one sacrifice. And after that, Christ sat down forever at the right hand of God. So simply moving a comma over can change the entire meaning of the, of the phrase. <clears throat> and that's why I think I said to you, before, I don't even think it's our business to worry about the punctuation. Don't change a thing in it. But they contradict themselves because in their, <clears throat> in their Apostles' Creed, or the Creed they recite, at every Mass, they say that Christ is ascended into heaven from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. 
Well, if he's seated forever at the right hand of God, he can't come back. So they create a contradiction for themselves by moving, by fooling around with the Bible, changing the comma in order to justify a false doctrine. 